Okay, we're going to switch things up, and I'm going to do just a quick little talk just to frame up our discussion about building scale and impact. And I've got a couple of messages. First, thank you so much to Startup Guy, an amazing conference. Really, really pleased to be here. Um, uh, Steve Rockland, CEO of Impact ROI. And I want to talk about two core messages about building scale and impact as we're talking about in this session. The first is, is that the world's biggest challenges are your business opportunities. So if you're following, in 2015, the United Nations agreed, all the countries of the world agreed on the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 global goals to solve the world's biggest challenges by 2030. These goals include goal number one, end poverty by 2030. Goal number 13, mitigate and solve the, the, the challenges of climate change. They have goals about gender equality. They have goals about access to education. All kinds of big, hairy, audacious goals. Now, a commission of businesses led by Unilever with some of the world's leading business schools and thought leaders have estimated that the sustainable development goals represent a 12 to 36 trillion with a T, dollar market for business. All right, that 12 trillion actually resides in four different sectors. Food, we're growing to nine billion people on Earth very, very soon, we've got to feed everyone. Health, we've got to make sure that everyone has access to good health care. Energy, clean energy, all right, speaks for itself. And fourth, tech. Now, a group that I work with, a revolutionary group, it's called JESSE, the Global Enabling Sustainability Initiative. Look at jesse.org. This is a group of tech companies that have decided, large tech and companies, uh, incumbents for the most part, that have decided that they're gonna use their technology to try and save the world and make money doing it. Um, and so Jesse has identified that there's a $2.2 trillion opportunity for tech companies that want to get involved in addressing the problems that the Sustainable Development Goals are trying to address as well. So that's a key message. Now, what does this look like? Well, if we're talking about tech companies, we can start to think really out of the box. And one of my favorite examples is a report that I've worked on with them that's actually looking at human rights. Now, human rights doesn't look like the obvious area for a business opportunity. But there are a number of startups right now that are working with companies to deal with the problems of sweatshops. And so taking a smartphone and giving them to factory workers in vulnerable countries and surveying them to see, are they being abused by their managers? And they only need to hear from one of the workers that there's a problem to get that message to a big brand like a Nike or a Gap or a Levi's. Last thing they want is to deal with the risk and a headline of a sweatshop problem and they will be mobilized to engage with their factories to solve and correct the problems immediately. Right? Now, I can't give you the name of the company working on this because there are actually three. Um, there are three that I know of that are actually developing competing technologies right now. So actually, this is a growth area and something that I never would have thought of or expected. So that's one key message. A second key message that I want to give you uh, in terms of building scale and impact is that good is the new green. Right? So what we're seeing right now is we're all familiar with companies like uh, Tom's and Warby Parker's where you buy one, give one type of model, right? Well, that's just the tip of the iceberg right now because my firm, Impact ROI, has created what many consider to be the leading business case analysis on the benefits of being good. And the benefits are pretty amazing. So that if you are considered by your customers, your investors, your employees for being good, you have an opportunity to boost your sales or sales premium by up to 20%. You have an opportunity if you're publicly traded to boost your share price by up to 6%. You can reduce uh, uh, employee turnover by up to half. Um, and the list goes on. So there's an opportunity right now to think creatively if you're not addressing the sustainable development goals, if you are thinking about how you are marketing and reaching your customers, your employees, and your investors in new ways to show that actually you're positioning yourself to have purpose, to be responsible, and to care about the society that you're engaging in in your communities, you have an opportunity to uh, ramp up your revenue and your valuation uh, by, by a significant proportion. So that's the message that I wanted to start with and then turn uh, to my colleagues here who will tell you how they're starting to live and do that every day. So first, Lisa and Stuart, would you mind just introducing yourselves? Sure, 
Hi, everyone. My name is Lisa. I am a partner at Norwest Venture Partners. Um, we are a 1.5 billion venture firm based in Palo Alto, another office in San Francisco. Um, and we invest early to late stage across consumer, enterprise, healthcare. Um, and actually, Grove is one of our portfolio companies that is creating um, products that are just better for our consumers. And believe, believing that we have several companies that believe that a better, better for you product sh should be um, affordable to the everyday consumer. So I'm Stu, and I work at Grove Collaborative, which is Lisa's favorite portfolio company. Favorite. Uh, um, uh, so started Grove in 2012. Um, the first four years had a little bit of a different business model. And so Grove now operates a direct-to-consumer commerce platform where we sell a combination of brands that we own and third-party brands in the home and personal care space. So you can think of categories like hand soap, dish soap, paper products, shampoo, things like that. Um, the company has grown sort of over the last six years to give folks in the room a sense because, I mean, I, I remember the startup feeling super well. For the first, from, in the first four years, we went from sort of zero to 30-ish, um, and in the last two years have gone from 30 to call it 1,300 folks at the company. Um, so it's been a, a really fun journey, and um, it has actually been awesome to have Lisa along for the ride. So excited to, to talk about that with all of you today. Fantastic. So switching my moderator hat, Lisa. I'm fascinated by Norwest and very interested in terms of the investment model that you have. So could you tell us a little bit more about that and how you start factoring in environmental and social factors in terms of the decisions that you make? Yeah, so um, so as a venture firm, we are looking for smart entrepreneurs who are building disruptive products in massive markets. And what we're finding is that there is just a, a rising consumer trend for consumers who are more educated because of the internet demanding better products for your, for themselves at an affordable price. And so what we find is that especially companies that are creating uh, working along the things of just social impact, um, there's a lot of benefits to the investment model. I think apples to apples, it's just a superior investment decision to invest in these companies, um, you're able to drive better consumer demand, better consumer loyalty, um, higher word of mouth, um, lower employee turnover. So I quite like you, what you said, which is good as the new green. And so um, so we're just moving to a place where mission does matter um, in today's world. So. Fantastic. So, all right. Now, what I'd love to hear is, you know, give us some examples. I know we're going to hear from Grove, but, but give us some examples about how this is come into practice? And have you had exits that, that you know, balance this sort of doing good but also delivering real results uh, in profitability? Um, so I'd say that we're, we started investing in this space probably within the last five years. We've just seen a rise of these direct-to-consumer models. So of course we have Grove, which is better for you household products. Um, we have companies like Madison Reed, which is better for you hair care, um, Ritual, which is in the vitamin space. And so I would say that um, all of these companies have scaled very quickly. Um, largely because there is good product brand market fit with what the consumers want. And I think that we'll start seeing liquidity events in the next five years or so. That's fantastic. All right. So now, Stuart, let me put you on the spot um, and take us back in time and talk about founding Grove. What need were you trying to fill? So when I, I founded Grove really because of something my parents did as a kid. So when I was like 10 years old and first understood what, what business was, I thought that seventh generation, which for those of you who don't know, is a brand of natural home and personal care products that does you know, 300 ish million dollars of sales. I thought that was like the biggest company in the world. In my fridge, there's you know, one SKU from Coca-Cola. In my driveway, one SKU from Ford. Underneath the sink, like uh, 25 SKUs from seventh generation when you're 10. Like, you think that's the biggest company. Uh, but fast forward into my professional life, spent time as an investor at a firm called TPG Capital. Spent a lot of time in the grocery channel in particular and was struck by a couple of things. The first, I found out that seventh generation was actually tiny, uh, but looked at this category as one where it's a massive category, non-food CPG is about $2 trillion globally. Only 4% penetrated into e-commerce and really poorly prepared for that transition. And also one where the product that consumer wanted, consumers wanted wasn't well represented on shelf. So I'm gonna spend hopefully not too much time, but a second sort of like pulling back on why the CPG space is the way it is. So if you take the laundry category, you know, double digit billions of dollars a year in the US, Tide alone, for example, does $9 billion a year globally. So this category, P&G has a roughly 40% market share in laundry. Tide is their biggest brand and everyone in the room can probably tell me 
the color of a Tide bottle. And you can probably imagine one. Those bottles are big and bright orange because that's a format that works really, really well in brick and mortar. It sells well at Kroger, it sells well at Target, it sells well at Walmart. But a dilute neon colored product isn't necessarily what you would build if you wanted to sell the product online. And so we have this like this is really interesting scenario where a category, there's no in-person experience with laundry detergent, a category that really can be experienced super well through a direct consumer relationship, massively underpenetrated because the legacy incumbents have spent so much time building up a ton of shelf presence. And so as we go to market today, the stuff that we think is really exciting comes as a direct result of the dominance that the P&Gs of the world have had in the offline space for so long. If you think about Tide, for example, that product is 80% water. The Grove laundry product uses 90% less plastic than a conventional laundry product. It ends up also being cheaper for the consumer when we, I have a, a prop because good consumer CEO. Um, this is a glass cleaner from Grove. It's a one ounce concentrate. It looks really different from a 16 ounce bottle of Windex. And to consumers add this to a reusable glass vessel. And so there's all of these opportunities to change the category in a way that's better for the consumer, better product, lower price point, lighter environmental footprint that really are enabled by a huge transition in the way that consumers will buy these products over the next one, two, five decades. All right, so let me follow up with that because you were talking about consumers. And uh, I'm, I'm really interested, are you ahead of your consumers or are they ahead of you? What are they demanding and, and what gives you a competitive leg up with them? So it's a great question. I mean, it's like the thing that I just held up, the one ounce glass cleaner, right? This is different. This requires real behavior change. And probably the thing that is my favorite learning you know, is that consumers genuinely want to be good people. And you know, I remember in the early days trying to explain that actually you know, dilute formats are worse for the consumer and the fact that we have concentrates and you add your own water, that's a feature, not a bug, to a consumer who really takes pride in the home that she's creating. And so you know, in the categories where we have played, we, we are number one market share across the board. We launched a paper brand in the middle of last summer called Seedling, which is a tree-free paper brand made of bamboo and uh, sort of like waste stream sugarcane. Really great sustainability story. Within 60 days of launching that, paper sales on our platform had tripled. You know, in the hard, in the excuse me, the sort of surface cleaner categories like the concentrate I just showed, our own products have number one market share in all of those categories. The consumer really wants to be there, but you know, to Lisa's point, the direct consumer medium allows us to tell such a different story than you could possibly get on shelf, you know, anywhere. Right? And you I think something that you do well is that you you're able to leverage since it's built on the internet all the data that you get from consumers to to create better products than the alternatives that they could find, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the big things, big advantages that we have over like the giant scary monsters of P&G and Unilever over the long term is you know, they don't have a direct relationship with their consumer. And the consumers want to engage today, especially consumers who care about your category. They want to engage and they want to help you innovate. It's really hard for them to do that when their only interaction with you is picking up a product off shelf. And so you know, for us, we probably have 50,000 customer touch points a week, something like that. Um, get a ton of feedback from our community, which allows us to build product that's different from what other folks have built before, but also really in line with what our what our customer wants. I think what we're also finding is that you know, back in the day when you have like the P and Gs and the Unilever, they they pushed a lot of products to you, and consumers these days because they have um, these companies are able to create direct relationships with every customer. Um, they're able to create an emotional connection, like a much better emotional connection than the P and Gs and the Unilevers of the world. And so, as an investor, what I look for is you know not it's very easy to push products. It's very difficult to create an emotional connection. So, are you able to create an emotional connection with your your customer out there, right? And that's, that's through the brand. Um, but sometimes even brands not enough. Like what I'm starting to see as a shift is that um, now it's kind of easy to create lots of brands just because there's lower barriers to entry to start companies. But now it's about movements, right? It's like, can you create a movement that people want to be involved with, that they're willing to change their lifestyle to adapt to that movement? So, I, I'm interested in hearing from both of you about the management challenge here. Because you know, uh, Startup Grind, there's been a lot of talks the last day and a half about just how difficult it is to set up a management system that drives revenue and profits, right? 
But here, what we're talking about is this tectonic shift that we're seeing where more and more companies, not just startups, but incumbents as well, you have to manage for profit, planet, and people now. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious about the takeaways that each of you have in sort of experiencing this and what you've learned, what, what works and what are the pitfalls? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't necessarily accept the premise that it is hard to create a management structure that drives value for all stakeholders, including planet, community, and employee stakeholder groups. You know, I, I think about Grove as a company that has the opportunity to grow over 20 years. 50 years, you know, for a really long time, the category is that big. And if that's true and you want that to be true, there's opportunity to balance all of those stakeholder groups. And, you know, for our category, like in the paper category, we have a reforestation program. We've planted something like 100,000 trees in the US just in the last nine months you know, as a result of people buying paper product from Grove. And so, you know, there's definitely an element of, you know, can you find a give back that is appropriate for your impact? Uh, but sort of across the board, I think there are opportunities in every category to think about your business as an impact business. And I think if you do that, the resulting sense of shared mission is super powerful, right? Like when I give like all hands company talks, it's easy for me to talk about what we're doing in a way that gets people fired up. And I think, you know, we have a culture that celebrates you know, our, our company mission, help all families create a home that reflects the best of themselves. We have a culture that celebrates helping families make better decisions. If we had a culture that celebrated profit, we get a really different type of person, right? You get a really different type of buy-in. And so, you know, in my experience, the, the positive impact of the company and our ability to attract and retain high quality talent that drives profits are, are super closely linked. Yeah, I would, I would double click on that and, and echo it, which is just that, um, you know, it takes a village to raise a person, but I also think it takes, you know, society to make these companies succeed and all startups succeed because you have to be able to attract financing, attract, attract the best talent, um, and attract the consumer demand. And so if you're able to align with an authentic mission um, that resonates, and I think that missions that can resonate are much more durable. It's not like a fad that comes for three years. It's something that is sustainable and can be here in 15 to 20 years. Those are the types of businesses that we're trying to back as VCs. Lisa and Stuart, thank you so much. Fascinating to hear how you're approaching this. Thanks for Startup Grind. Thanks, yeah, Thanks thank you. Man.